Okay, we're going to revisit that uh, double slit experiment for just a moment because of the things that we have learned in the, in the uh, last hour or two. This will look just a little different to us. So here's that double slit again and notice that this is now the future, right? The measurement is in the present. See, it's the present. So the measurement takes place in the present. Before the present is the future. So we see particles exist as probability in the future. Okay, and here, of course, this is the future. And that's the present where the measurement's made. Okay, so that's the key. Particles are probability distributions in the future because everything in the future is probability distribution. Not just particles, everything is a probability distribution. So when we get down to how do we interpret this, well, there's no interpretation. It's just a fact. Particles are probability distributions before they're measured, because everything else is. Now, the other thing I'd like to, to mention is that when they decided that this was a probability distribution, how come they decided to make it a probability wave so that the probability contributions from each of these two slits went together just like waves, you know, so the superposition, remember I described that on Friday, the superpositions so that the waves would be some integral number of wavelengths and you'd get a spot and some integral number of half wavelengths, you'd get a blank, you'd get nothing. How come the probability acted like regular matter waves? Why did it choose to combine that way? And it's because of consistency, you know, we need consistency. This is a physical reality. Everything must reduce to physical particles. Yet. This micro view has to be consistent with the macro view. And in the macro view, you have these waves, and they produce this distribution. So the probability waves had to combine in the same way that the matter waves do, so that you have a consistent history. So now you don't have two different kinds of light, particle light and wave light. You just have one kind of light. And sometimes it's a particle. depends on when you measure it. So that's why it had to uh, go together like that. All right. So quantum mechanics today, that particles should at the most fundamental level be probability distributions, was and still is unexpected. Physics today so it will tell you that they have no idea why that is. They just know that if you assume that, the math works, and you can predict answers. So it was eventually accepted as a fact. And like I say, they, there is no interpretation. The reason particles are probability distributions is because everything's a probability distribution before the measurement. It's just like everything else. Almost 100 years has passed since we understood that particles were probability distributions before they became particles. And how far have we gotten with that? Where are we now? 100 years worth of physics. You think we ought to be way out in front of that. All right, that happened in the 1920s. You know, we're at 2010, and that's 90, 90 years. And what has happened is almost nothing has happened. There's been basically no progress whatsoever on coming up with a little toe, combining or understanding quantum mechanics and understanding relativity. But there has been since then some, some new things that have uh, come up, some new quantum uh, effects, if you will. And they're all also easily explainable once you understand how, how reality works. One of them is entanglement. You know, entanglement is kind of a, was a new thing maybe a decade ago, but it's, it's really uh, been new in the last five or six years. And that is you have a particle with, particles have to have conservation of momentum and spin creates momentum. So you have a particle that breaks into two particles. So you have to have a spin up and a spin down so that the angular momentum stays zero. Okay, so this is then a matched pair. They're entangled. It started out as a particle. You get two, like, a, like you maybe get an electron or a positron. Okay. Now, if you separate these particles and you flip the spin of one, the other one flips the other way because the rule is that there's conservation of angular momentum. So the experiment that they did not that long ago is they moved them really far away, a long way away. And they flipped one, and the other one flipped almost instantaneously faster than it would have taken light to go from one to the other. So it looked like, well, they've exceeded the speed of light, but they did not because no information traveled from one to the other. It wasn't a signal got sent out from one and had to tell the other one to flip. They're really both the same particle. 
they're just a different manifestation of that same one particle. In the larger conscious system, it's more like an if-then statement. If this one's up, that one's down. If this one's down, this one's up. So it switches, not necessarily instantaneously, it's just at the time, it's maybe just one delta t, much too small to measure. Another thing that kind of illustrates the probabilistic nature of uh, reality is called um, tunneling. And tunneling's been around for probably 30 years, maybe more, 40 years. It's been around a long time in physics. And what that is, is you put particles in a box. And I won't bore you with the physics, but we'll say that these particles are trapped in the box. And typically that means it's an energy trap. The particles don't have the energy to get out of the box. Physics, we call that a potential well. They don't have enough potential to get out past the barrier. Okay, so we put a bunch of particles in a box and it's impossible for them to get out because they don't have enough energy to get out. But what happens is we find that some of them get out anyway. Well, how do they do that? Well, the physics term, physicists generally have a good sense of humor, so the physics term is that they tunnel. Of course, they're, they're not really tunneling. You know, that's not to be taken literally. That's just a, a figurative tunneling. What happens is that those particles in that box, like all things, before you make the measurement, they're just probable. They have a probable location. They're just probability. Some of the probability of where they are is way out here under the tail of the curve, outside of the box that they're in. All right, now that's probably one in a million because they have a probability distribution like this and it goes plus infinity, minus infinity, and they go goes way out. But in that box, let's say you have a billion particles. Well, now, out of a billion particles, one in a million can happen a lot, right? So you get that one in a million those particles just suddenly appear outside the box. Okay, so when the measurement's taken outside the box, they find particles that aren't supposed to be there, that are supposed to be inside the box. It's called tunneling, and it works the same way. They go up and take a, when they take the measurement, the measurement goes into the probable reality. It says, what's the probability where this particle is, and it just takes a sample. Most of the time, the sample's under the fat part of the curve. Some of the time, it's out under the tail, and that particle just materializes, if you will, outside the box. When the measurement's made, they find a particle out there. Okay, so that's tunneling. Matter of fact, that's so common that, that you may have heard of tunneling diodes. We actually use that effect in electronics. It's an old effect, so it's a, but it's another quantum effect that shows you the fundamental nature of reality as a probability system. That's just how it, just how it works. Again, with the tunneling in the early days they would say that the particle went faster than the speed of light. But that's not the case. It's not that it had to travel out there. It's just that it existed out there. You see, it's not a matter of traveling. It didn't have to get out of the box and go through a tunnel and appear over there. It just appears. You make the measurement and you find some out there that aren't supposed to be there. Okay, so that's the that's how that works. All right, now we're going to now that we've solved the, the quantum mechanics problem, understanding why particles or probability distributions, we're going to solve why is uh, light invariant under the motion of its velocity. Each one of those little green boxes is a quantum of volume. Okay, so this represents our space. Now this is just a cartoon, obviously. Don't tell anybody that Tom Campbell told you that at the, at the base of reality, our space is little green cubes. <laughs> yeah. That's not true. But this does kind of give you a little something to look at that makes it maybe easier to see. So these little green cubes are quantums of volume. Now, if you were going to make a, a virtual reality game, first thing you'd want to know is how much money is this going to cost you? You know, what's, how you have to size your computer? How big is the server has to be for this reality game? There's two pieces of information to drive that fact. One of them is going to be the size of the pixel. Now here you see, we have a 3D pixel. This is a pixel of volume. It's one quantum of volume. So how many pixels, you know, how, how big is your pixel? Now in your computer, in your computer screen, you know, you have pixels, right? And if you have more pixels, that means you have more resolution. You get tinier and tinier little dots, right? So you can break your picture into finer and finer pieces. Okay, each one of those pixels on your computer screen has data in it. It has color and it has intensity. You know, how bright is it and what color is it? Okay, 
So for every pixel, if you have a lot of pixels, you need a lot of data. So pixel density gives you resolution, but it costs more data. The second thing you need to know is what's the frame rate? How often do you have to refresh those pixels, right? Because if you've got a lot of pixels and a lot of data, how often do you have to change the color and the intensity in that particular pixel? Okay, those two numbers together specify the resources required to run a virtual reality. Okay, now that's the same with our virtual reality. Okay, now we have a delta T. Here's our little delta T. That's a quantum of time. Now that's that cycle time. That's that outer loop, right? We get a delta T every time we update the, the simulation. That's our 10 to the minus 44 seconds, little um, cycle time in our, in our digital simulation. So the result that we need in order for this to be a viable experience space for us to grow, our space has to be what's called homogeneous and isotropic. Isotropic means that it's the same in every direction. So space this way is the same as space that way. Homogeneous means that it's the same over here as it is over here. Okay. So our space has to be that way. If our space wasn't that way, then our rule set wouldn't work. See, so our rule set requires that. Calculus wouldn't work. Calculus requires smooth functions. None of, our, none of our physics would work very well if we didn't have this homogeneous isotropic space. So it's the fundamental nature of our reality to have to be that way because that's required by our rule set. Well, how do you get that? The only way that you can get that is if these pixels of volume are constant. Okay, if you didn't have a constant volume, what that would mean, if you had bigger pixels one place and smaller pixels another, think of that on your, on your monitor. What happens if you had a, a computer monitor and down here in this corner, you had a whole bunch of real fine pixels, you know, real high pixel density. And then your pixels up here got bigger and bigger. Maybe you had a few pixels in the middle, like one inch square. And then over here you had some pixels that were in the middle. And an object passed through there, what would happen? It would be terribly distorted. It'd be looking like a funhouse mirror, right? Like a, those distorted mirrors. The object would come up and suddenly it would expand and spread and it would go back together and it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be a, good, uh, a good reality. And it's the same with the time. If the time were not constant, things would be speeding up and slowing down. It's like your frame rate on your computer. What happened, you know, now in your computer, your frame rate, you know, at least the TVs used to be 60, 60 frames per second. Now they've doubled that and a lot of it is, is uh, 120 frames per second. But let's say it was, oh, 10 frames per second for a while, and then 300 frames per second, and so it would be like going from slow motion to fast, rewind, and that would be happening. That doesn't make for a very um, good reality either. Things would speed up, slow down. And what we, what we have here then, if we take that constant, that constant delta V, because we don't want to have a ruler <coughs> over here that's one foot long, and then we move it over here, and it's a foot and a half, right? All those delta Vs have to be the same. We don't want that kind of distortion. So if that's a constant, and you can always take the cube root of a volume, and you get a distance, volumes distance cube. Divide that by the delta T, which is the constant frame rate, and you get this constant C, which is the speed of light. So the speed of light has to be constant because delta T and delta V have to be constant because we need an isotropic homogeneous reality that's consistent so we can learn, so it has feedback. You wouldn't be good for your child, you know, in the third grade to have a reality where things come and go, you know, where things sometimes there, sometimes not. Sometimes it speeds up, sometimes it slows down, you know, different, uh, you know, a fun house doesn't make a good schoolroom. It's entertaining, but it's not consistent. You need consistency if you're going to, if you're going to learn and if you're going to have feedback that means something. All right, you divide those two and you get, get this constant C. So now this delta V and, and delta T are specking the resources we need to run a virtual reality, right? That's the, that's the frame rate and it's the pixel density. So you divide those, you get C, and what that means is that's as fast as something can move through this reality. That's the speed limit, why? Because it has to move through contiguous cells, so a one delta T you've got something in this cell. The next delta T, as far as it can go, is over here to this cell. The next delta T, as far as it can go, is over in this cell. Why doesn't it just jump from this cell to that cell? Well, that's called teleporting. That's not exactly a consistent, uh, you know, uh, homogeneous isotropic 
thing, and that's you know your schoolroom. You you wouldn't learn much if suddenly your teacher teleported in and teleported out, and your books disappeared, and the school building went, came back. You know that's not a kind of reality you can learn in. So basically, we have we spec the resources required for the virtual reality in terms of frame rate and pixel size. That gives us a constant that produces this homogeneous isotropic reality that we need to be functional. And what that does is creates this upper velocity of how quickly things can move through our space without teleporting around. So you see how all that works? That's why C is a constant, because we have a virtual, digital, simulated reality. And it makes sense for it to be a constant, because it wouldn't make sense to live in a funhouse reality where things teleported, and this was a foot, and this was a foot and a half over here, just because your pixels were all different. Okay, so that's why we have that. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be constant in a sense. It only has to be constant enough that it seems constant to us. But the point is, why would it change? I've made a lot of simulations, and I've never yet had a dynamic time loop you know, that kept changing. There's no point in that. There is no point in that at all. But this is digital. You know, digital, you can always stop, get the pause button, and uh, you know, restart. It doesn't have to be constant completely. It just has to appear constant to us because the reality has to appear workable for us. OK, a little bit of a summary. Relativity theory is a logical consequence of C being constant. I think I told you that on Friday. Once you understand that C is constant, all of Einstein's special theory of relativity falls out with a little algebra. It's, it's really simple. It's all based on that one fact. Okay. The magnitude of C represents a constant that specifies the demands placed on the virtual reality rendering engine. And C is specified to evolve to optimize learning within the reality frame that appears consistent with space time. OK, so the physicist's search for the little toe that unifies relativity and quantum mechanics is done. We've solved quantum mechanics, why particles should be probability distributions, because everything in the future is probability distributions, and um, why C should be constant, because it's a virtual reality. OK, so now let's, let's go on since we solved that problem. OK, summary and results. I'll go through these real quickly. Modeling consciousness, I like to keep going back and picking these things up, because these ideas are a little, a little hard to, to, to grasp all the uh, logical ramifications of these. So it, it helps, I, I think, if we kind of go back over it and, and uh, keep reinforcing it. Modeling consciousness is a self-modifying digital information system that evolves towards states of lower entropy. Right? That's the fundamental model. Physical reality is a virtual reality, a subset of the larger consciousness system designed to help budding individuated units of consciousness called an entity, that's us, evolve, lower their entropy through experience and interaction. Our virtual reality begins as a future probability distribution and remains that way until a measurement's made, until the data is needed for each individual. Conscious intent can modify future probability within the constraints of maintaining continuous, consistent history and abiding by the rule set. So those are like the, some of the fundamental principles that we've, we've got here. Okay, what are the results? The result is that physics and metaphysics becomes part of one logical theory and are thus unified. Eastern philosophy and theology have been integrated with science. Love and spirituality are both defined in terms of entropy, a measurable quantity. Normal and paranormal are unified. There is no paranormal. It's all normal. You just need to see it from a larger perspective. We've derived the fundamental purpose of existence in general, and our existence in particular. Our purpose is to evolve toward lower states of entropy. We're part of a system that is trying to evolve. The result is that time, relativity, and quantum mechanics have been derived from one overarching fundamental theory with just two assumptions. The measurement problem and the invariant velocity of the light problem, that's the little toe. And additionally, the appearance of backward causality problem and many other problems have been solved. Okay. Synchronicity, mind-matter scientific anomalies have been explained, placebo effect, backward causality, modifying random numbers. All of these are scientific experiments. This is hard scientific data that has no explanation. It does now. Lowering entropy increases the energy, power, information available to the evolving entity. 
lowering entropy, spiritual growth, increasing the quality of consciousness, evolving one's consciousness, and growing up are all just different expressions of the same thing. Love is defined as the fundamental expression of low entropy consciousness. The larger consciousness system is aware, evolving system. It's real and therefore finite. We are an individuated unit of consciousness, chip off the old block, one with all there it is. All reality frames and everything contained in them are a part of the same consciousness system. All are connected. All consciousness are netted. All of us can communicate with every other piece of it. We're all connected. We're all on the net. We're all part of the same whole thing. Okay? All reality frames are all part of the same system. What is the difference between physical and non-physical? Only the observer's perspective. There is no such thing as physical and non-physical. It's just your point of view. So, do you see theology falling out of this? I'm always asked, always, every, every uh, workshop I've done, I have somebody who raises their hand and says, is the larger consciousness system God? Right? I get that all the time. I generally answer, the larger consciousness system is just a natural, evolving, trying to survive and grow and lower its entropy. It's just a natural, evolving system. It's finite. It's imperfect. I avoid the God word because it comes with such strong emotional overtones and mostly because it means something different to everybody who says it or hears it. And it's just not good communication skills to use words that have different meaning to everybody that you're speaking to. You start saying things you don't intend to say and having meaning you don't intend to convey because they're hearing something different than what you're saying. Remember those two consciousness and I talk out of my experience, they listen and interpret out of their experience. So it's better to use words that we all kind of under both, we all agree what, the, what they mean. Yet, some, for their own reasons, find the concept very comforting. They like that idea. What's in a name? Right? I called the larger conscious system Aum because I thought that would be fun. In the uh, Buddhist theology, Aum is the sound of the one. Okay? So I called it Aum, and then I had to make up an acronym to fit, right? <laughs> but anyway, I just, you know, I, I'm easily amused. But, <laughs> but the point is, what's in a name? You know, you can call it whatever you like. Everyone should use their own metaphors. Use metaphors that work for you. There's nothing wrong with that, you know. Watch you don't get carried away into a space maybe that has more belief that you'd like, but, you know, there's enough... There's enough room for all of us to use our own metaphors. We should. Metaphors are personal. They have to come out of our own experience. So let's just kind of look at the facts of what we know about this larger consciousness system relative to us. The larger consciousness system is pretty much omnipotent, right? It kind of has got all the data, right? Pretty much powerful. It's playing all ends of the game. It's sending us the data streams. It made you not see that car that you ran into, you know, when you're back in that parking lot. So it's, it has, uh, it's very powerful. It's got all the data, runs the program. It uh, tries to help you succeed because you're part of its strategy for, for evolution. You get your own data stream. That means your relationship to the larger conscious system is individual and it's personal. Prayer works. That's science, right? It's just an intent modifying future probability. The system works on right intent, leading to right action. It's a moral system. The system is about, you know, it defines right and wrong in terms of entropy. It's about the evolutionary struggle between good and evil, evolving versus de-evolving. That's the difference between good and evil. All that's defined in terms of entropy. Most fundamentally, it's about growing up. It's about changing. It's about becoming love. You know, God is love. You know, that's, that's a phrase we've all heard. However, there's no creed, there's no dogma, there's nothing to believe or swear to. In fact, belief is the enemy. Belief is a trap. Belief is replaced by open-minded skepticism. If you've listened to, we went through this list, you've probably heard an awful lot of description that sounds like we've kind of nailed the fundamental essence of most religions in that 
in that list of things, the way the larger consciousness system is. Does this describe then a more general theology that is not a theology at all, but science? It's logic-based, not belief-based. It's derived from the exact same science and logic that derives quantum mechanics and relativity. It explains reverse causality experiments, the biasing of random number generators, placebo effects, psychic healing, remote viewing, et cetera, et cetera, all come out as completely understandable science. So it's just a thought. You know, make up your own metaphors. But here's something else to think about while you're thinking about that one. It's easier to look downstream causally than it is to look upstream. Remember that picture with, when we had the bacterium and it was very hard for them to understand sunshine and, and planting and refrigerators and that sort of thing? That's looking upstream. So let's just imagine a little bit looking downstream in the same big cosmology guide issue. And we know this is a fractal pattern. So what happens if we, let's say, produce a consciousness computer? And, you know, computers had a lot of what we said was about life was about, right? They have memory, they have input, they have uh, processing. What they're not good at is modifying themselves and they're not really good, and we give them a purpose, whatever job that we give them. Okay. But they're not good at modifying set themselves. They're very good at processing. And one day, we will probably make them good at modifying themselves, basically programming themselves, modifying their own code. And when we do, we will have a conscious computer. Because you don't build consciousness. You build the platform that can contain consciousness, and consciousness just happens. Consciousness is just having the right, you know, platform's not quite the word, but, but you have the right capacity. And when you do, consciousness happens. So if you have something that allows you to have all of those five things that make up consciousness, it will be conscious. That's how you evolve into every nook and cranny of the system where you can. Your evolution springs up everywhere that will support it. Give a platform that supports it, it'll become conscious. See, our scientists want conscious computers. They want to go manufacture consciousness. That's not how it works. You just produce the right environment, and it becomes conscious. That's kind of a little digression there. So we make a conscious computer. And then we take these conscious computers, and we hook them together, and let them interact. And then we make a whole lot of them. Let them interact in this big mainframe. Okay, the server is going to be some big, say, Hewlett Packard mainframe. We let them interact in this computer. And they interact and they evolve, and what they're evolving to do is lower their entropy, right? Increase the quality of the information, more signal, less noise, and so on. All right, now they form community, let's say. Now, are they one with the server? Yes, they're just junk, you know, pieces of code. I mean, they don't have to be separate things with boxes of metal. When I talk about a computer, it's just a chunk of, a chunk of space inside that larger mainframe, right? It's just a chunk of memory and, and uh, processing power and so on that's sitting inside that mainframe. So yes, they're one with the computer. And for them, being one with the server, what's the server? Well, it's that big HP mainframe. So what's God to, the, to that group of sentient consciousness? It's that HP mainframe, right? So now we're looking downstream, and we can kind of see how the pieces work looking downstream. We don't see very well looking upstream. So when you think about this concept of God, I th you probably need to think of it a little more locally in terms of our system. So what do we have, some kind of big alien mainframe? You know, well, it doesn't matter really, does it? That's beyond our knowing, right? That's what that chart was about. That's really beyond our knowing. But we can kind of see how it goes downstream from that. We see the possibilities. We see how that works, and this is a fractal reality. So just another thought to think about while you're trying to come up with a good name for the larger consciousness system. Okay, we're going to do some consciousness and brains. First, we're just going to do the basics. Then we'll get a little more detail. Consciousness is fundamental. It's the superset. The physical reality is virtual. It's the subset. Physical rule set evolved providing for the evolution of critters with brains. Remember we talked about this reality wasn't manufactured, it just evolved in a simulation according to the rule set, which is all of science and all the science that we don't know about yet too. 
Okay, the physical is derived by sending data to an individuated consciousness, thus creating a perception of a physical universe. We're just interpreting data. The virtual brain, as a creation of consciousness, cannot create consciousness. Okay, that's a thing, you can't have a thing creating itself. Or there is a metaphor that describes the brain as an information link. You know, it's a, it's a, uh, a transducer, a conduit. You know, we're here and up there's consciousness and there's this information link going back and forth and that's our brain's kind of the information link. Well, that's that little stick you had on a, high, on a happy face, right? The only reason you need that, that brain to be a transducer and that, inf that comm link there is because you have to see yourself as separate. Everything has to be separate to exist. That's the only reason that you have that. Okay, the metaphor makes sense to us because we see our bodies as fundamental and ourselves as separate. But, you know, we are here, body and brain, and our consciousness is out there someplace, right? That's the way we see it. That's not it. That's not it. So that's a useful metaphor about the brain being this transducer, this, this you know, the comm link, consciousness sends information down to the brain, but it's not true. That's just the way we make it up. So I'm going to explain to you what, how it really does work. So that's not what it is, but that's like, a, that's like training wheels. That's a nice little description that kind of helps us talk about it, but it isn't really true. You know, we do that all the time in science. You know, we say, well, atoms, what they are is they're these round spheres like a basketball, and they've got these little BBs flying around them, you know, and that's not what atoms are like at all. But that's a conceptual thing at an elementary level that allows us to have a conversation about atoms, even though it isn't right. That's sort of like this, too. Okay, do the, do the characters in World of Warcraft have to tune into the server? No. Their image on your computer display and their personal traits are simply data, information, generated by the server and saved as a character file, just as you are. Okay, now the larger consciousness system is the server. Okay, once you get that smiley face off the stick, there is no distance or separation, no in here and out there within consciousness. Distance and separation are 3D virtual reality concepts. Don't constrain consciousness to be like its virtual reality creation. We tend to imagine versions of what we already know or think we already know. All right. A better brain <coughs> metaphor. There is a partition or a folder with your name on it that separates your experience from the larger consciousness system. Okay, that partitioned subset of consciousness is called a free will awareness unit. That is what you identify as you. Okay, the free will awareness unit is a collection of data, memory, rules, and processing that interprets the data stream defining experience within the virtual physical reality. It also makes the choices. But we're talking about consciousness here. This free will awareness is not a brain, it's consciousness. It's a little subset. It's that fragment of consciousness from your individuated unit of consciousness that's participating in this virtual reality game. It's the player, if you will. It's, it's got the mouse and the joystick in its hand. The free will awareness unit represents your little c consciousness. Okay, little c consciousness is your local consciousness here as opposed to consciousness, which is the larger consciousness system. So we have a little c local consciousness. Consciousness is all consciousness, but again, we make these arbitrary, you know, boundaries to make it easier for us to understand and comprehend. <coughs> okay, how does the free will awareness unit learn how to interpret the data stream? Well, I think I mentioned that on Friday. You learn that from birth, okay? When you're first born, that's what, that's what babies are all about. They're about learning how to interpret the data what they're doing. They're teaching their free will awareness unit how to interpret the data. Okay. The brain is a, you might call it a physical analog or virtual representation of the free will awareness unit. Now this next slide will help you set that straight, I think. The function of the virtual body, okay, the body and brain's function is to provide constraints to the free will awareness unit to enable consciousness to express itself within a virtual reality trainer. Okay, so the, the free will awareness unit's interpretation and interaction is limited 
to what's allowable according to the rule set. In other words, it's a limited to what the body and brain can do within the PMR environment. Okay? The virtual brain is not a source, repository, or processor of information. It's only a constraint upon the source, storage, and processing of information. Okay, the virtual brain must be capable, according to the rule set, of storing and processing you know, a gazillion gigabytes of information, whatever it is that you know, we can process up here. I don't know that number. I'm sure somebody's calculated, but let's just say it's a gazillion. That's a good round number. So it has to be capable, according to the rule set, of processing a gazillion gigabytes of information. But it, being virtual, doesn't actually store or process anything. It's just a template, an evolved simulation result based on a rule set whose purpose is to determine what constraints must be applied to an individual's data stream to keep the reality and action consistent with the rule set. You see, the rule set defines the structure and allowable interactions. Okay? These constraints specify the data stream that we interpret as a reality. So you see the function of the body and the brain? It's to set the constraints on the data stream so that the data that you get then is interpreted to be this physical reality. Your body and brain are just virtual. The free will, the free will awareness unit is constrained to function within the limits of your body and brain's ability. Okay, that's what it's there for. Okay, now the world of Warcraft works the same way. We'll get back to this in a little more, but we're gonna take a side issue first. There's two kinds of change that you can run into. One is you can gain new capabilities. Okay, this again has to do with brains. In those cases where you're gaining new capabilities, the consciousness leads and the body follows. Okay, and the, my favorite example of this is sheep morality. Now this was an article I read uh, in one of the scientific journals and basically what this is about is that this article said that they had noticed that sheep actually had moral behavior. And I think the moral behavior they were looking at was the fact that mother sheep would take care of another mother sheep's young lamb if that mother was gone. They would actually take that lamb in, they would nurse it, they would take care of it like it was their own. And the scientists would marvel at that because, you know, moral behavior, you know, in animals, I thought that was just our thing, you know, but here was this moral behavior in the sheep and there was no benefit to their own genetic, you know, the idea in, in biology is that you're trying to further your own genetic material, right? Well, helping this other little lamb had no benefit for them. Actually, it kind of took some of the milk, some of the supply away from their own kids. Of course, when you find out something wonderful like that, that these animals are moral, what do you do about it if you're a scientist? Well, you kill them and you, <laughs> and you look at their brains. So they killed the sheep, they looked at their brains, and they found this little part of the brain that was developed that is similar to where our ethical processing gets done. And they said, well, look, you see the, the, uh, the brain developed this capability and therefore the sheep became moral because the brain evolved this moral capacity. You see, that's just backwards. The sheep became moral because they cared. They're sentient entities. They cared. They became moral and because they became moral, their brain had to develop the, you know, to represent the capacity for that moralness. So the consciousness leads, the body follows. As we grow up, we physically change ourselves because our physical system has to reflect what we are in consciousness. So as we have experiences and we grow up, we change. Our brains change, physically change, but it goes both ways. The other one is you lose capabilities already attained. That's usually the body leads and the consciousness follows. Okay, a brain that becomes damaged, limits, adds to the constraints of how the free will awareness unit can interpret and interact in this virtual environment. So if something happens, you get you know, uh, banged in the head or something and it damages your equipment, your brain, then because your body can know, you know, your body is what's setting the constraints on what your free will awareness unit can get as far as data. Well, now it can't get that data because now it's not able to do those things. It doesn't make those connections. So 
in that case, the body leads, the consciousness follows. Now, that's though just little c consciousness we're talking about. Big C consciousness isn't decreased or hurt or bothered, you know, it's just a free will awareness unit has another constraint on it as far as the data that it can receive. All right, so those things work both ways. So what we're talking about is basically in the world of Warcraft, we'd say that you're getting a new spell, you're getting more hit points, right? You're, you're growing, you're, you're getting bigger. That's how you level up. Well, you level up here by pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, by growing, by becoming moral, so you develop that part of you that supports that morality. Well, what about on the other end? What about on the losing all capabilities? What, uh, what happens, take a dramatic case, what happens when a, a five-year-old is out walking down the street with his parents and a mugger jumps out from behind the bush and kills both of the parents right in front of the five-year-old? Does some damage, doesn't it? That does some real serious damage. That creates some fear that's hard to get rid of. Well, fear's moving in the opposite direction. So what you've done then, that physical system will change to reflect that damage. You've caused brain damage. Now I'm calling brain damage anything that modifies the brain in such a way that you're now in a hole and you have to work, up, you have to work out of it. Okay? So it works both directions. So now let's take not so drastic a case. Let's say that you go to a horror movie and in that horror movie, you know, you're terrified silly, you know, because people keep jumping out from behind bushes with chainsaws or something. It makes you afraid to walk next to a bush on the way home. Well, the point is how it is you interact with that movie. If you interact with that movie in a way that you're there and you're feeling it, and when, you know, the girl, you know, that doesn't have much clothes on because that's the way they always are in horror movies, you know, the girl that's half naked, when she screams, you scream, you know, that sort of thing, then it's going to do brain damage. You get brain damage from watching that movie because now there's a fear placed into your experience, right? You interpret things based on your experience. It just depends on how much you absorb that. Now you go into that same horror movie and you think it's ridiculous. It makes you chuckle because of the way these chainsaws keep jumping out from behind bushes, you know, and you think, you know, man, that was dependable, you know, we knew that. Then it doesn't affect you. It's not going to create fear. You're not going to worry about walking behind, a, you know, next to the bush on the way out to get to your car then it doesn't affect you so much. Now what about kids playing these violent video games? It's the same thing. If they really get into it and they're wreaking havoc in a personal, deep way, it's brain damage. If they're not, if they're just having fun, you know, shooting up and doing whatever the game says and they're not attached to it emotionally, eh, not a big deal. So you have to think about all the things we do, even the petty things, they affect us. They add to our experience. We are the sum total of all of our experience. If that experience is fearful and negative, that affects us. If that experience is light and happy and positive, that affects us. One affects us in a negative way, the other in a positive way. And we have to deal with it. If we have that negative stuff, then that we carry that around as a burden until we can grow out of it, get rid of it. But now it's a, something we have to do. We, we, we're in a hole, we have to get out of it. So that's a, another, uh, you know, this, you have to take seriously what your mind's doing. There is no physical brain, just a computed, simulated, virtual brain that functions according to the simulation's rule set. Virtual simulation, right? Now, the properties of the simulated virtual body and brain provide the constraints that limit how the individuated unit of consciousness can express itself. Okay, interpretation, choice. Now, it does that by limiting the expression to what can be naturally supported by PMR evolution. So what happens is your body and brain limit what the consciousness can experience because your body and brain embody the rule set because that's how it evolved with the rule set. So it's the rule set that you have to match. So you have consciousness and it has to, it, ha it can't go beyond what the rule set says and the rule set is contained in our, our bodies and our brains. That part of consciousness that interprets the data stream, you, the VR player, is contained in a folder with your name on it called the Free Will Awareness Unit, and that's your little c consciousness. Let's look at some limitations. The virtual brain sets a constraint on the content of your experience and what you make of your experience. Okay, if your particular brain can't capture or process some potential piece of information, then that experience is unavailable to you because it lies beyond how the rule set has defined your specific limitations in this virtual reality. 
but that's a limited little c consciousness. A, li a limited big C consciousness is not implied. You get Alzheimer's, brain tumor, have a stroke. That changes the limitations imposed on your experience by the rule set. It affects your little c consciousness, okay, your intellectual awareness, but it doesn't affect your big C consciousness. The big C consciousness is the driver. The little c consciousness is the result. Okay. Now let's look at the interface. Okay, we've already decided that data is not flowing in and out of your physical brain, right? We just think of it that way. The brain is virtual. There is no separate physical brain. The data stream flows in and out of your consciousness, your free will awareness unit. That's your experience packet partition in this larger consciousness system. All the action is in consciousness. The brain, like your body, is virtual. It only exists as probability until your skull is opened. Then it's interpreted as data. Your body and brain are no more or no less real than the body and brains of characters in The Sims or WoW, video games. Do you think these characters have brains? Well, no more, no less than you do. <laughs> if in one of these games, imagine, if in one of these games, say The Sims would be more likely. In The Sims, let's say there was a doctor that did brain surgery. What would you see in that Sims game when The Sims doctor opened up one of those Sims character skulls? What would you see in there? You'd see a brain. Of course, the people that make this game would render a brain. What else would they render, right? And from the game's perspective, it would be assumed that all the data defining that character's experience is stored in that brain. That would be the assumption. But we know better, don't we? That data is really stored in the server. We're the same. There's very little difference. Okay, well, then what is the difference? Well, there are three major differences, but only one is fundamental between us and the Sims character. The World of Warcraft, or Sims character, has to live in a slow server. Our server is very much faster, so our graphics are better. Matter of fact, there was a comment that, uh, that uh, one of the people made when talking about Whitworth's paper about virtual reality. He said, you know, the graphics are fantastic, but the plot sucks. <laughs> that's what he said about this reality. So that's one. Our graphics are better, but that's not an important one. Okay, second one is the World of Warcraft character running around on your screen requires a comm line with bandwidth because it has to go out to the user, and the user is separate from the server. But in our case of consciousness, you're in the server. You're part of the server. You're one with the server. Okay. Now, the one that's important, the only other difference that's important here, is that our rule set that defines the simulation is a zillion times, that's another good round number, a zillion, is a zillion times more complex and detailed since the set was evolved and not constructed. So we started with a rule set and we involved this set, right? These bodies, these brains, these conditions, everything here, the environment, all of that evolved out of this meticulous detail evolved out of this rule set. Our physics, our science, that's different. In The Sims, they, somebody had to sit down and build the set. It's a constructed set, so it's very, very limited. But they still have to abide by the rules that built their set, you know. Again, Sims characters drown, you know. If a World of Warcraft guy jumps off a high cliff, they get hurt. You know, it's that sort of thing. So they still have to live by their rule set. But their rule set is crude and very simple compared to our rule set because theirs is constructed, ours is evolved. Okay. Our virtual simulated brain and body must have the capacity and functionality, according to the rule set, to enable us to do whatever it is we do in this physical virtual reality. We cannot do or be anything in this physical reality that the evolved rule set does not support. The virtual brain and body are just data, simulated constructs, math models. The free will awareness unit, which is a real chunk of real consciousness, is limited by the math models rule set. It's the way all virtual realities work just as you're limited by the rule set of the math model that defines what your World of Warcraft character or Sims character can do. See, it's the same thing. All right, when the brain dies, 
Okay, at death, this could be when the body dies, but you know, we often see ourselves as brains, right, attached to bodies. At death, that temporary partition that we set up, that free will awareness unit, is deleted. But it's been backed up and mirrored continuously. You know, we talk about mirrored. That means every time you write a datum here, you write a data someplace else. So it's in, everything's in the larger consciousness system. Okay, so it, now it exists in that unconstrained. It's not constrained with this rule set anymore. So it exists in that unconstrained larger system, that subset that's constrained here. We don't need that anymore. The collection of data that define the larger you remains in the larger consciousness system. Okay? But again, is it a bunch of little ones and zeros over in a corner someplace, like your Word document is not? No. It's, you're through the system. You're part of this. Of course, and that just stays that way. It stays in that larger consciousness system until, again, you bubble up or partition off some little portion and define a new player in another physical reality game. Okay, you have to start as a newbie. You have to learn all over again how to interpret data, but with a potential that reflects the quality earned in all the previous packets. Okay, all right, we're going to, that's enough, of, enough about brains. We're going to go on to another point. We're going to talk about graphics quality and video lag. Video lag is the big problem in reality games, right? Virtual reality games, that's the big problem, is video lag. Video lag means that your character moves late. You, know, you make a control, you move the mouse, and a little bit later, you actually get the motion on your screen. That's video lag. Okay, why do you have video lag? There's two things that cause it. One is being slow, and the other is being last in line. Okay, now with World of Warcraft, if you're playing a, a, one of those reality games, you are last in line. You're probably slow too, because that server is probably a lot faster machine than your machine on your desktop and your network that brings that data to you. Okay, so you're probably slow and last in line. But there's not much you can do about the last in line because that's it. You know, the game's played in the server, you have a computer on your desk, you have to be last in line because it has to compute in the server before it sends the data out to display an image on your screen. With consciousness, it's just the opposite. With consciousness, slow and last in line are still the problems. We can't fix slow. What's slow in this virtual reality? It's us. It's these mechanical, electrochemical bodies and brains we, we have. That's what's slow. Consciousness is really fast. That's an information system. So we have these slow bodies. So we can't change that because that's the rule set. The rule set has evolved us and we have these slow mechanical systems. So what can we do to decrease video lag? We don't have to be last in line. Let's take that body and move it as far up in the chain of events as possible. That will eliminate as much of the video lag as we can. Okay, well what does that, what does that mean? Here will be an optimal design. Okay, we're going to start, of course, in this, this process of cognition, we're going to start with future probable reality database because that's where we always start, right? That's in the future. That's what's likely to happen. And we'll look at that future probability and right away, before we even make a decision of what we're going to do next, before we get to the present and our free will, we're going to start that body moving. We're going to get that body underway because, you know, we're only dealing with 10 to the 44 seconds. You know, it's a tiny little bit. So we're going to give that body a little head start based on what we probably think will happen. Okay, then after we get the body going, then we actually get to the present where we make a choice. Now, if we don't make the expected choice, the body's going to have to stop moving that direction and go somewhere else, isn't it? But if we make the expected choice, that body then just keeps right on going and it got a head start on us. Okay, now after we make the choice, the next thing that happens is that we generate little c consciousness. We become aware of the fact that we want to move and that we're moving. Okay, so that comes last. Now this is going to reduce the video lag. Now, very occasionally, uh, we have this problem that the guess is wrong and the adjustments have to be made. And when it does, guess what? We get slow and we get clumsy because we have to reverse and start and do something else. Okay, that's a rare circumstance, but we generally don't notice it and very little attention 
is paid to it unless we are honing our physical responses right to the peak like we're an athlete. Okay, we're an, op we're an Olympic competition. Then we know, you know, you can't interrupt your mental process. You have to stay continuous. What are the consequences? Well, if you're conflicted, fearful, and thus uncertain and tentative, your choices are harder to anticipate, your motion's jerkier, less smooth, less coordinated, and you're clumsy. Athletes must condition and focus, know exactly what they're doing, how they're doing. That's why they practice, practice, practice to where it's not any longer a mental construct that they're going through. It's just what they do. It's just behavior. It comes right out of the inside of them. It's not something they think. If they have to think about it, they're lost. They need to be doing it on a deeper level than that. Fear, anxiety, doubt, and to a lesser extent, just being disengaged, just being kind of adrift and not plugged in makes you clumsy. Now here's an example of that. If you take a, if you take a board, let's say it's a eight inches wide, you know, a typical plank, and you put it across the floor here, nail it down, make it real steady, Everybody in this room could walk across at one end to the other. No problem. Now you take that same board, put it 150 feet in the air, hold it just as steady, and probably about three-fourths of us would fall off before we got to the other side. Why? Fear. Fear makes you clumsy. Fear makes you tentative. You start, you stop, you're not sure, this, that, and you get all out of whack with this system that's trying to anticipate your moving, getting your, your muscles going in one direction, then reversing it, going in the other direction, you get very clumsy. Okay, everybody gets future data just prior to it happening, but not necessarily at the intellectual level. You're getting it at the physiological level, okay, and not far enough in advance to operate on it. These effects were well covered by uncertainty. Nobody really knew about it, until not that long ago, they had some very sensitive equipment that could measure little electrochemical potentials at the muscles, okay, in the brain, in the nervous system. They could measure these things, just like the fact that light was a particle and you had this dual particle wave thing. None of that was available to us. We didn't know about that until we got sensitive enough instrumentation that we could see that deep into reality. Well, this works the same way. Okay, so given this video lag problem, one would expect that slow-moving biochemical mechanical processes would be anticipated. Now, an electrochemical process is also an emotional process, right? I mean, hormones get secreted, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it has to flow in the blood, this organ gets triggered, you know, slow electromechanical processes. All right, so let's see what happens. Back in the 70s, some German scientists discovered something they called the Breitschaft's potential. It was a rise in voltage measured by an EEG, but now it was tiny. You know, we think of EEG in alpha, beta, theta states. You know, these are huge. We're talking about things that are probably three or four orders of magnitude smaller. That's why they were never measured before. They measured these potentials that had to do with muscles, and they found out that muscles begin to move in response to a stimulus before the stimulus is actually received. So they did it in two ways. It was cued and uncued. Now the cued is like Ring a bell, and when, when you hear the bell, raise your right hand, that sort of thing. Well, just before the bell would ring, this very sensitive measurement equipment would see the muscles starting to get ready to move. That's why they called it the readiness potential. Things would secrete, muscles would start to contract, you know, chemicals would change, and the, the, the muscle started the process of motion before the bell would ring before there was any awareness in the little C consciousness that they were going to move their arm. Okay, it was that sort of thing. So that was one of those scientific mysteries, you know, a lot of people did it and it was confirmed. And the other was uncued. And that means that basically when it's uncued, um, you wait until you're, you have this inclination to move. You know, your little C consciousness is aware of it. And when your little C consciousness is aware of it, they found out that they were measuring already that your muscle was aware of it. And a guy named uh, Benjamin, either Libet or LeBay, depending on how French he was, he looked at this and said, that's scientific proof that there's no such thing as free will. Because before you even know that you're gonna move, your muscle's moving. So obviously it's not your consciousness that's in charge because your consciousness, well, that was just wrong, wrong, and wrong. He had all the wrong concepts. You know, 
having this inclination to move has nothing to do with free will. It has to do with selecting from your decision space. You know, and uh, the way they, they timed it, uh, anyway, it was, it was not good science, but he won an award for it because that was science like that idea. You know, science is in this deterministic mode. They like things that are deterministic and, and absolute like that. So science jumped right on that, and that was the big deal. Matter of fact, the, the number of papers that had to do with free will shrunk to almost zero after that because it came very out of fashion to even talk about free will. Only dumb people talked about free will, you know, if you learned you understood that there, there was none, that was all an illusion. So anyway, that was like in 1980s that uh, this happened. But the point is, is that we see that the body starts to move before the stimulus, okay? Just what we would expect, all right? Now I'm gonna have a series of slides here and these, these slides that uh, have the italics in them, those words are not mine. Those words came from a list it was originally uh, posted by Dr. Craig Hogan, of unexplainable, repeatable, well-documented scientific experiments. This was his list. And this was like a, you know, uh, throwing down the gauntlet. Look, we have the science, and it is unexplainable. That's what, that's what it was about. So he mentions Dean Radin studies showing that a body reacts to a calm or disturbing picture six or seven seconds before any information is available to them to see the picture. In other words, before the picture is shown. Now the way that worked is they had a computer with a lot of pictures in it. They assigned each picture a random number and then they grab random numbers in a random number generator and when it would fit the picture, they'd go grab that picture. Of course, from when they got that number to where they grabbed the picture to where they showed it is just how long it takes a, you know, a computer to put something on a screen, which is you know, milliseconds, right? Not very long. And the people would react six, seconds earlier. Now mostly this was emotional reactions, but they'd start to see, see they could tell the difference between, let's say a horrible picture, you know, something awful, because that secretes different kinds of hormones and different sorts of things are going on in your body, and then a beautiful, lovely, sweet picture. That secretes different sorts of things going on. So they had these people all wired up with their body and their electrochemical processes, and they would see these electrochemical processes start to go and they could anticipate whether it was a nice picture or a terrible picture. Okay. Six seconds ahead of time. That's before the random number was drawn. Okay, now that completely stumped everybody because you know the random number hadn't been drawn yet. Well, that's not surprising. Okay, we're virtual, right? You think the computer is any less virtual? Everything physical is part of the virtual reality. It's all just data. Okay, the larger consciousness systems play on all sides of the game. That random number generator isn't really a random number. That's what they call pseudo-random numbers. It comes out of an algorithm. <clears throat> the system knows what random number is coming up, you know, as far in advance as it wants to know. But you don't have to be clever in that situation if you're the system to tell what the next random number is going to be or even the tenth next random number is going to be. So the system knew and the system started the slow electrochemical processes humming before the person had to use them. Otherwise, we'd be in this reality frame with video lag. We'd be trying to do something, and we'd have to wait for a second or two before our body started to move. And that wouldn't work very well for us. We'd kind of lose the, the fluidity here. So we have these kinds of experiments. Researchers have shown people physiological manifestation of empathy at a distance. They would take people who knew each other, people who maybe cared about each other. They were friends, and they'd put them in separate rooms and then they would do something. They'd show a terrible picture to one person, or they would you know, pull their fingernails out, or you know, scream at them, or do something awful. And the person in the other room would react to that. Now again, it's not at the intellectual level, it's at the physiological level. They'd react to that. Precognitive dreams, prescience, these are experienced by millions of people. So we know how that works. You know, the probable reality database allows anticipation of future events. Also, everybody's networked. So if you have a, a, an experimenter that's going to grab a card with a picture of a plus sign on it, and then you know, they're going to look at it and say, well, what's, which is this? You know, a plus sign, a circle, or a, or a minus sign? Well, you know, if you're connected, we've already got another pathway to deal with that. So we know how these things work. You know, it's just going to those databases. Everybody gets the information. Some are better than others to bring it up into their intellect. 
Okay. Now this is predictive, a general principle. You know, not just these specific instances with the researchers, but you could probably think of a, another five or six ways to do research in this area. Not going to be based on one guy's experience or one guy's experiments. Horton's meta-analysis studies of people, and evidently I, I added this because there were it was on his list, and there were so many of them. You know, 309 experiments, 113 articles. You know, from 35 to 87, 62 different investigations, two million. You know, this is this is like. You know, it wasn't just some guy with six people, you know, in a back room in a lab someplace. We're talking about a lot here. The data showed that people were able to predict what will be shown at levels that exceed those expected by chance. Sure, probability reality database and network communications. Reverse causality. Now, this was Hogan's list. These are his words. Notice the ones that I have highlighted there. He says, retro intention studies showing that intention somehow has an effect on an experiment group of cardiac intensive care patients. Well, we know it didn't really have an effect on those patients. It had an effect on the data that described those patients. So he was talking about the same, some of the same experiments. Clicks on Geiger counters recorded at one time can be influenced by a consciousness a year later and have more recorded clicks from the left and the right. He says that Geiger counter clicks can be influenced. It wasn't influencing any Geiger counter clicks. Geiger counters did whatever the Geiger counters did back then. It influenced the data. The problem is thinking that the data necessarily has to equal or equate to what the Geiger counter did. The data is still in the future if nobody's looked at it yet, and it can be modified. This is a whole scientific problem, you know, the, the scientific method problem. You know, the data doesn't necessarily reflect what happened because we don't live in a deterministic, objective reality. The data doesn't necessarily reflect what, the, what happened. It's still in the future. What happened's gone. Okay, he says, consciousness can affect machines that use energy, such as random numbers generators. Again, it doesn't affect the machine. It just affects the data. So even the, you know, the people who are working in this field have no idea really what's going on. They think Geiger counters are changed, you know, people are healed, you know, 10 years earlier and all this sort of thing, which doesn't make any sense at all, right? It's completely nonsensical, but they don't know any other way to, to look at it. Okay, now here's another one. Physical explanation of artifacts of consciousness always fails. Okay, people have tried to explain consciousness in terms of the brain. Never been able to do that. The fact that no one's been able to use a form of energy to interfere with any of the telepathy, remote viewing, or psi experiments. Okay. And you would expect that you could interfere with them if they were some sort of physical process, but consciousness is not physical. So goodness, you're putting you in a physical box, putting you inside something that shields physical fields is not going to have any effect on consciousness. It's not a physical phenomena. Okay. And of course, distance makes no difference either. A person can remote view just as quickly and easily on the other side of the planet as they can next door. You know, it makes no difference. Put them in a Faraday cage that seals them off from all electromagnetic fields makes no difference. Consciousness is not physical. You can't mess with consciousness with a physical device. All right, this gets us to value of a theory. Unfortunately, in our world, the value of a theory is mainly judged on how well it supports current scientific beliefs, but that's not the way it's supposed to be. Theory should be, one, does it explain what's known? Does it explain it better with fewer assumptions and more elegantly than the old explanation? Does it make predictions? Does it explain things that are unknown? And does measurement and experiment then confirm those predictions? That's the value of a theory. If a theory does those things, then it's a very valuable theory. If it can't do those things, then it's not a very valuable theory. So now we're going to look at the biggest, the biggest mysteries in physics, of course, of the, of the little toe, the quantum mechanics and, and relativity. In metaphysics and philosophy, the biggest issues are why are we here? What's our purpose? What happens after we die? What's the nature of existence? Do we have free will? Is there a moral code? How are we supposed to act? Is, how does synchronicity work? You know, how do we account for anomalous, paranormal happenings? Okay, that's the big questions in metaphysics. In theology, it's what is God? Where does it come from? How does it function? What does it want, need, demand? Why? 
How are we connected to it? What are the rules? Moral code, life after death, anomalous research, bright shaft's potential, influencing random events, random number generators, backwards causality, instant empathy, anticipation of events. Now, all of these are solved. They're all science. They come from one overarching set of logically consistent principles based on just two assumptions. Now, it's very difficult to overcome your beliefs and think in terms of a big picture. But when you do, everything becomes simple, straightforward, and logical, and coherently tied together, and logically connected. This is real science. My big toe represents a logical, scientific foundation that explains what Lao Tzu and the Buddha were talking about, right? You hear them talking about compassion, love. All of this is just hallucination, right? This isn't real. What we need to do is grow up, let go of ego and fear, see? That's what you get from Lao Tzu and the Buddha. Now we know why that is. We have a, a kind of a scientific background that makes that rational. Why some people are happy and others aren't. Well, you're in a system with a purpose. If you're moving counter to that purpose, toward de-evolution, you're going to have a hard time of it. The system is going to try to continue to teach you what's right and wrong, foundation of morals and ethics, what's important, what's not, how people sometimes know the unknowable, remote viewing, that sort of thing, reincarnation, what happens after you die, personal psi experiences, paranormal information, precognitive dreams, remote viewing, out-of-body experiences, synchronicity, contact with other with other entities, um, you know, the nature, origin, and purpose of Dr. Fredkin's other. Now we know who that other is, or where that is, or we can explain it, how it is. Consciousness is the computer. All right.